in this last part of the tutorial, we're going to put everything together because now you see we've calculated the expansion coefficients for this initial state, the psi u of 0. And we know the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So that's enough information for the time-dependent solution. So uh, this is the equation for the time-dependent solution here. Again, we know the c sub n's and we know the psi sub n. So now we need to perform this summation and apply this exponential within that summation. So to do that, I'm going to get a new code block here. And first, I'm going to define a tau vector, which is our scaled time. I need to specify a number of time points. For now, I'll say 31. The next thing is to construct this exponential and perform the sum. I'm going to do this within a for loop for each time step. And for each time step, I'm going to get a psi u for that time step. So I have to make a storage vector. I'm actually making this a storage matrix. Now we have to calculate the psi vector at each time. Here's where the for loop comes into play. So we're calling for a for loop iteration for each time step. And each time step, again, will be a particular row of the matrix. And what will we put in there? Well, that's the... I already have psi uh, sub n in a matrix where each row is a particular eigenfunction. We need to multiply each eigenfunction by its own time dependence here. So I'm going to apply a diagonal matrix. So if I have this matrix uh, left multiplied or pre-multiplied by the diagonal matrix, each diagonal element multiplies the corresponding row in the psi. So uh, we want to make a diagonal matrix for this exponential and then each diagonal element will multiply the appropriate row of our eigenfunctions. So let me show you a little bit about diagonal matrices here. Let's start with a vector of five elements, one through five. I can feed that to the diag function, and it makes a five by five matrix with each element on the diagonal. And so that's kind of what we want to do here. In fact, to simplify things, I'm going to make dt be the time-dependent diagonal matrix here. And it's going to be what? Well, we need uh, an n vector. So I'm going to make here a n vector, which is 1 to capital N. And we need the n vector, each element squared. That'll get us the n squared up here. We need to then multiply this by pi and tau, negative i and a 2. So negative i is neg uh, negative 1i. 1i is the complex or the imaginary number. And then we're not going to multiply this by tau, but a specific element of tau, tidx element of tau. So this should give us our uh, exponent. This is still a vector, so we have to put it in diag. So here's, again, the diagonal matrix with this on the diagonal, each term, uh, one for a different n vector. Next, we're going to use this diagonal matrix, and we're going to multiply the eigenfunctions. And that will do that, so that multiplies each row by the appropriate time-dependent scalar for the given time. Now we need to do the sum, uh, weighted sum, in fact. These cn values are the weights, and they're in a row vector already. And so if I left multiply this product by that row vector, it's going to multiply the appropriate rows of this product, and then it's going to sum them. So it's very handy that we can just do this. Because MATLAB stands for Matrix Laboratory, we're taking advantage of how everything is interpreted as a matrix in MATLAB. This could be done using a nested for loop. Perhaps that's more pedagogical, but this is more elegant. Now I need to visualize this. 
<coughs> this is two-dimensional data. It's a matrix. And we are going to need matrices to specify the time and position data for these. So we can take the vectors that we have, which are u and tau, and use the mesh grid function to make a capital U and a capital tau, I suppose. The whole purpose here is to give us matrices that we can use for our two-dimensional data. And I'm going to now use the surf C function. We'll give it our x data, y data, and a z data. x data is, we'll say is u, z data, or y data is tau, and z data is not going to be the time-dependent psi, but it's going to be the magnitude squared of that. And I'm going to run this just to make sure it works. Okay, this isn't what I expected. The reason is uh, I need to put in the exponential. I forgot there's an exponential here, so now I think that'll work. Okay, and so the only reason I knew it didn't work before was I knew what it's supposed to look like. And here's our wave function, uh, magnitude squared in time. We're going to do a few things here to clear it up and make sure we label it properly. I'm going to get the formatting from above. The X label should be U. And I'm going to run this. Here's my U on this axis. Here's the time axis. I don't like this view. I'm going to rotate a little bit. So I can click on the picture, click rotate, and then I can once it gives me control, I can click and drag. Okay, finally I got control and uh, I can manipulate it. I like this view right here because now I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have time on this axis, and it's going to go from left to right, and then position going from small to large also goes left to right so this is a decent view something like this and you can see also we look at the initial value at time zero and it looks like this plot that we got here so that's what we see I'm going to make this a little bit better there are a few things I can do of course I need to add a Y label and maybe a Z label and I'm going to divide this here so that I don't need to perform this for loop again, we'll just run this visualization section. Even still, it takes a little bit. If I click rotate here again, hopefully it'll take, it won't take so long. I'm going to rotate it now. And there might be somewhere here, it, it says the view. It tells me there's an azimuth and an elevation that I'm looking at. So I'll manipulate this until I see the view that I like and it's kind of like this so I'm going to say maybe 60 degrees azimuth and 40 degrees elevation so to set that view next time I can type view 60 40 and then it should come up like this again the other thing I might do is there's a lot going on here so I could shorten the time vector uh, so maybe I'll go to 0.1 instead maybe 0.2 0.2 and maybe to make things a little bit quicker, I'll reduce the number of U points to 101. I'll change it to 51. Save this. I'll run this again. Here's my new plot. Another thing I might like to do is do shading and terp. And that gets rid of the lines here on the plot. And here's my new result with a smoother looking graph. Maybe it's harder to see the details, but you can use shading and terp if you like, or if you don't like, leave it out. Okay, so this has been a tutorial. We've shown how to model the time evolution for a particle in an infinite square well. We calculated and represented the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. We represented a initial state and we decomposed it into a superposition like 
this, a superposition of eigenstates, and then we applied the time evolution of this equation so that we could calculate the time dynamics of our system. And what we see is it starts peaked and then the distribution in time broadens out a little bit and then maybe it gets peaked again and then it'll broaden out and maybe come back and get peaked again. So that's it for this tutorial. We've done some three-dimensional plotting now and numerical integration and a lot of other good MATLAB stuff.